we have now Yuri Lansky from Stanford, and he's going to talk to us about size of bulk fermions in the SYK model. So thank you, Yuri. All right. Uh, so hello. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Yuri. I'm a student of Shaoliang's at Stanford, and I'm going to talk about some work that we put out, I think, in February on the archive uh, about yeah the size of bulk fermions in the SYK model. So this is just a pretty sparse outline. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about operator size and why it's worth talking about in the first place, uh, and then our concrete definition of operator size. Um, I'll review the SYK model and the size of the chi fermions in the SYK model. Uh, it's strong coupling. And then we'll move on to talk about the bulk size. So uh, operator size on the one hand is kind of easy to think about and define because many people have an expectation of how it should work. Uh, usually in a quantum theory, you have some preferred set of operators. So we can always think of this. I think this audience is somewhat familiar with SYK. So we can always think about the SYK Majoranas, for example, but of course it's more general. But if you have such a set of operators, then you can expand any other operator or maybe just operators you're interested in, uh, in terms of strings of these sort of more fundamental fields. And so size is just some, you want to somehow measure how long the typical string is inside of your operator, or maybe how long the longest one is. Um, that's up to you. And many definitions, uh, as far as I can tell, have been proposed. And so size from the quantum chaos point of view, uh, it, people have used it as a diagnostic of quantum chaos. It's also related, for example, to Lee Robinson bounds in the sense that Lee Robinson light cones tell you when an operator could have non-trivial commutator with another one. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can you say anything about how unique this is or whether there is something analogous to Gram Schmidt that, that generates such a set of operators? Uh, so size is surely not unique. There's no, there's definitely, I mean, for sure there's no unique canonical definition of size, but there's maybe bulk arguments why certain definitions are better than others. So for example, you know, you could do some unitary rotation of the Majorana algebra and get operators that are large in terms of Majorana strings. Maybe you mean if you start with a particular single operator that you think is small and you want to progressively add operators? I was, I was referring to the preferred set of operators, uh, chi j, just how, how you pick that set. It's typically in physical input. Um, there's not really a canonical choice as far as I know. So you, there's no some, some systematic way of getting to the minimal such set or? Uh... Once, you have, once you have a set in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, I think that there are systematic ways to pare the set down. Um, but I think that just given an abstract vector space, there's not a good way. In fact, just given an abstract, well, okay, I'll, I'll say one result of Shaoling and Dan Renard that may be relevant, which is that if you're given a Hilbert space uh, and a Hamiltonian, then there is a preferred tensor product structure generically. Um, that's maybe surprising. But if I just give you a spectrum, there's in finite dimensions at least, uh, th we expect, even if the interactions are decaying, that there's a few tensor product structures that are quote unquote most local. But there's a proof that if your Hamiltonian was k local, it's almost surely only k local in one tensor product structure. And so then that gives you I a way. Uh, Dan and uh, Jordan had uh, some results saying even the spectrum decides that. Or Dan can comment here. Yeah, that's right. But I don't want to derail Yuri's talk, so I'll invite you to go on. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, anyway. So typically in realistic cases, you have this algebra handed to you, or maybe uh, you can run an algorithm. And yeah, so the size growth uh, can be 
there's the simple size growth where you just grow along a light cone. And this type of growth happens both in chaotic and non-chaotic systems, and it's important. Uh, size is also related to the four-point function, and you can sort of see it in the form of the four-point function when you relate it back to a commutator in a Poisson bracket. I won't go into the details. This is just anchoring. Um, if you're already familiar with these ideas, maybe it's helpful. One thing that is important to mention is that size can grow geometrically and internally. What that means is that size can spread, if you have a geometrically local system, size can spread out along your Lee Robinson light cone. But especially in chaotic systems, the majority of size growth happens internally inside of the region that you've already explored. The operator has to be able to get more complicated um, in order to saturate certain chaos bounds. So there's also bulk reasons to study operator size apart from just general interest in quantum chaos. So there, there are several conjectures that I found in the literature about bulk momentum and size. The first conjecture was bulk momentum is equal to size. The next conjecture was bulk momentum, bulk position uh, together determine size. And the last conjecture was that bulk momentum is the rate of change of complexity, which was set roughly equal to size in some regimes. And so this work can be seen also uh, just as a way of trying to pin down these conjectures and make some uh, concrete statement. So something in that direction has already been done uh, before this work by um, Maldacena, Lin, and Yang. And they found that uh, they were studying approximate symmetry generators in the bulk dual of SYK. And they found that some of these bulk symmetry generators, some linear combination, some expectation value of linear combinations of these symmetry generators uh, is equal to a particular definition of size on the boundary. We'll actually reprove their result uh, in a different way, more directly from the SYK. And we'll also be able to extend it to bulk operators. So now I'm going to define concretely which size operator we're going to use or how we're going to measure size in general. So we'll always be working in some system with n Majorana fermions. That's the definition. And just to repeat, this means that any operator can be written as an expansion in terms of Majorana fermions this way. So our goal is actually to construct an operator on the space of operators that tells us the size. Somehow it should count the number of Majorana fermions that are in the expansion of this operator on average. And that's a little bit tricky because you've got these O, N, J1 to Jn coefficients, which in principle have phases. Uh, and, but, but, but we're familiar with this problem from quantum mechanics. Uh, we'll end up squaring these coefficients and taking some relative weighting. Specifically, there's a particle number interpretation of our number operator. If you double the system size, now you have two n Majoranas. You can pair up the Majoranas and make complex fermions. Then you can take the first n Majoranas and make them sums of uh, creation and annihilation operators of the fermions you made by doubling the system size, the complex fermions you made. Then our size operator is actually going to be the number operator, or is isomorphic to the number operator of these CJ fermions. So then the way that you compute the average size of O is actually you end up, it's quite nice because you actually end up just quote unquote counting the number of chi j's in this expansion. Uh, in particular, you take the vacuum of the CJ fermions and you act with O written only in terms of the first n Majoranas on that vacuum state. And you just measure the number of uh, fermions, the expected number of fermions in that state. And that's the average size of O. And the number operator is just the number operator of the complex fermions. Um, there's an alt alternate definition that will be useful. Uh, it's equivalent to the previous one. So operators form a Hilbert space with uh, this trace inner product. And when I want to emphasize that O is a vector in this space, I'll write it with this curly, uh, with this curly Dirac ket. 
and the strings of length n uh, of Majorana fermions, they span orthogonal subspaces in this trace inner product. So what that means is that there's another simple definition of this size operator in this Hilbert space. Uh, it just, when acting on the subspace of operators that span by strings of length n, its eigenvalue is n. And that's what the definition here says. So uh, this is going to be what we call the infinite temperature size. We have some expansion of O, we have this number operator, and the uh, size of O, the average size of O, is just uh, the expectation value of our number operator in the state corresponding to the operator we're interested in, uh, normalized, importantly, by the overall uh, Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the operator. Uh, interestingly, this definition of the size also lets you study the whole distribution of sizes of the operator. So we can study the second moment and the nth moment in general um, in this natural way. The quantity that's related to bulk generators is actually a size at finite temperature. So one naive issue you could take with the previous definition of size is that if you're working in some low energy subspace or you're looking at a particular state, two operators of dramatically different sizes may act the same way on your state. And more generally, we're just interested in characterizing the growth of operators at different energy scales. And so one natural measure is to look at how much longer our operator makes the thermal density matrix. And the way that we do that is we measure the size of the operator against the thermal density matrix and we subtract off the length of the thermal density matrix. The factor of one half is there so that actually the uh, average size is computed by a four point function, by a conventional, more conventional four point function. Um, if you like, if it bothers you that there's a half row on one side, you could move a quarter of a row on the other side of O. And the discussion that follows will become a little bit more complicated, but it's in principle still doable. Um, this quantity is the simplest to work with. So this is the one we choose. It's also motivated in previous work. Um, by Stryker and Shaolin Chi, Alex Stryker and Shaolin Chi. Um, we will actually compute in principle the full size generating function. So if we take the logarithm of this function and we take the first derivative and set mu to zero, we get this n beta of O and in general, uh, Z contains of course much more information than just the average size. So this is the quantity we'll compute and to give a map of the remainder of the talk, uh, we'll compute this quantity in the strong coupling regime of SYK. And then we'll extend it, we'll extend our boundary result in SYK, we'll write it in such a form that we can use it to learn something about the size of reconstructed bulk operators in the dual of SYK or in the putative dual of SYK. So this is the SYK model. Uh, I'm sure that everyone here has seen it a thousand times, so it's gonna go away quickly. Um, it's an ensemble of Hamiltonians and each ensemble is given, each element of the ensemble is given by a totally anti-symmetric tensor. Uh, the Q parameter is the number of Majorana fermions that are involved in a single term in the interaction. Uh, we take always Q to be even and the j's we'll take to be distributed this way. In fact, the only number that you have to remember from this box uh, is this curly j squared, which sets an energy scale for the Hamiltonian. This model is approximately conformal at strong coupling, um, and the chi fields pick up a dimension one over q. Um, importantly, q is gonna be bigger than four, so it'll be important in our discussion of the bulk that delta is less than one half. 
There are two delta dependent constants that I will use, uh, B delta and alpha S, and these are determined in the literature. Uh, I believe that B delta is determined quite simply from the two point function and uh, alpha S is determined um, by uh, Maldas and, and Stanford. Uh, Yuri, I can't hear you. I don't know if other people can hear. Um, no, we could hear, I, I can hear, I think, yeah. Maybe it's the connection. Um, I can hear okay. Yeah. Okay, it's okay now, sorry. Shall I continue? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, so B, B delta and alpha S are determined by computations in the model previously. Um, and I'll just use these constants freely. I'll have an expression for B delta later. But the important point is that when you see these numbers, they're just numbers. Uh, they don't have any particular crazy scaling with N um, or J for example. So now I'll describe the low energy of this model. I just drew a picture of the thermal circle. Um, and so tau is the imaginary time. It runs from zero to beta. But phi, uh, I'm going to choose for convenience to run from zero to two pi. Or you can think that I set beta to, I work in units where beta is two pi. Now at low energy in the SYK model, um, all the degrees of freedom are reparameterizations of this phi. And, or the, rather, you know, the lowest energy excitations are can be thought of as reparameterizations of the phi. And there's a convenient way to think about them that will be useful later. So this is uh, Euclidean ADS2. Um, the dotted line is the conformal boundary out in infinity. And so the way that we visualize a reparameterization of the thermal circle is we embed it in this ADS2, um, Euclidean ADS2, the hyperbolic plane, the, yeah. And the way that we do it is we choose a curve of very long length. This is where we start to use the fact that we are at strong coupling. The length of the curve is uh, beta j, which is the, this quote unquote strong coupling over alpha s. And this is the quantity that we assume is much, much bigger than one. So uh, for every reparameterization of phi, which we will call theta, um, along with this constraint, at least locally, you get a curve in ADS2 up to a global SL2R transformation. Now, the effective action of SYK. Uh, this effective action I wrote, it's meant to be multiplied by n uh, when it's put into the path integral. So this is the effective action divided by n. Um, so the effective action of SYK is actually the, roughly speaking, the extrinsic curvature. It's approximately equal to the extrinsic curvature of this curve that's given by the reparameterization. So that is the action for reparameterization. Uh, we can use the gauss bonnet theorem to give a different expression, a different approximate expression for the effective action. And that's the length of this curve, which is fixed, minus the area, minus two pi. So we can think of this as a bubble that's uh, trying to spread out. In particular, the saddle point then is a circle of circumference L. So there's one more detail that we'll need from this picture. And that is that since we're considering reparameterizations of time, the reparameterization is theta, the two point function on this new saddle measures the geodesic distance between the reparameterized points. It's not actually equal to the geodesic distance. It's, the, it's some power, it's the cosh of the geodesic distance to the minus delta approximately. Um, but the point, the important point is that by looking, by finding the locations of the new points, according to the reparameterization, uh, we can find the two point function on that saddle. Great. Are there any questions? Great. So the size generating function is given by a two point function. Uh, I won't go through the derivation. It's a little bit hairy, but it's not particularly complicated. Um, for the sake of completeness, this is 
the two-point function that we compute. Um, this is the exact relationship to the size generating function. And this is the action. Uh, this is a bunch of symbols. Um, I will explain this action on the next slide, but it's here for completeness. So there's the SYK piece of the action. And there's an, a part of the action that comes from the presence of our number operator multiplied by mu. And this is the contribution, but I will explain what it does on the next slide, as I mentioned. So this is the quantity, uh, th th this is the basic quantity that we will be computing that gives us the size of the SYK formula. So what does this additional piece uh, to the action do? What it does is there's basically two insertions on opposite sides of the circle. So here I've drawn the original saddle point, the SYK saddle point. And for small mu, we perturb the saddle, we perturb the saddle. And the way that we do that is it's, it's an insertion of two operators. And you can think of it as a little tension across opposite ends of the bubble that pulls it together. And so the new saddle will look like this. Um, it's not hard to imagine that this will be a good approximation to the saddle and it can be checked more formally but it's just the original saddle squished a little bit together. It's still trying to maximize its area, but it has to balance against, and, and it's at fixed length, but it has to balance the tension that this additional action has added. And so if you, th this is already the new saddle. So we have computed, we have computed the new saddle, but how do you do it in practice and how should you think about it? Well, we can just take one of these pieces, and we can translate it down by an ADS2 uh, isometry. And it looks like a part of a circle. But now this circle has an opening angle, lambda. And actually, the whole, the whole saddle point is parameterized by lambda. And lambda itself is a function of mu. So yeah, to recap the story, lambda, this opening angle, um, it's 180 degrees. Uh, when mu is zero. As a function of mu, it changes. And that's sort of the easy part to visualize. And then you can find the new saddle that way. Um, and maybe it's a little bit complicated, the expression for lambda as a function of mu. So that's in our paper, but it's not very important. It just is necessary that it's a some function of mu. Uh, it'll matter for some of the constant factors, but that's about it. Um, already, at this stage, we have enough to find the size moments of the density matrix um, just by finding the saddle point. The reason is that this piece properly normalized is just the generator, um, is just the generating function for the size moments of rho beta. Uh, for example, here I listed the size of, uh, of rho beta as a function of beta j at strong coupling. And this is this B delta that I promised I would show you. Um, maybe something important to note is that it is proportional to n. Uh, the therm the density matrix is, is a large is a large operator. So now we want to compute the size. And the way that the size works is, as I mentioned, it's a two-point function in this new uh, saddle geometry, at least the saddle point approximation. So the two-point function is located, you know, one of the points will be at some time uh, phi 1. And if mu is 0, then there's no perturbation. And this is its original location. Theta is the identity function when mu is 0. But now um, it's, it's simplest to look in this coordinate over here and uh, find the new location of the point just by going the appropriate geodesic distance along this curve. And so that's what we do. Uh, it has to go the same fraction of the distance along the circle. And I've drawn a halfway dividing point uh, for reference. This is the string along where the tension is. 
And so we can visualize what happens to this point. Th at this stage, we're in a non-symmetric coordinate system, but we've already computed its new location. And then we can do an ADS isometry to go to a possibly more symmetric coordinate system. And that's the new location of our point. Now here I've drawn the ADS2, the generators of ADS2 isometries. Unfortunately, um, my labels aren't showing up, but the one on the far left that it looks like a rotation, I'm going to call a boost, B. The one with the vertical arrows in the middle, uh, I'm going to call E. And the one with arrows going to the right, uh, I'm going to call P. And of course, the reason is that P we think of as the momentum uh, that's been conjectured to have these relationships to size. E corresponds to the global translation uh, in global ADS2, and B corresponds to the boost. Um, the point of showing these generators here, uh, of course, it's quite clear in retrospect that we can just model the motion of this point as small actions by these generators. So for example, the one might argue just from these pictures uh, that the leading effect of going from the first picture to the second picture is uh, a little bit of rotation, a little bit of B. And then the main effect of going from the second picture to the third picture is a little bit of E. Of course, there's a little bit of P mixed in as well, but it seems like mostly we rotate and then shift upward. So that's the intuition. Um, we actually, you know, you just do this computation directly and find um, exactly the expression in terms of generators that generates the motion of this point as a function of mu. Um, in order to do that, oh, so, so, so we do this and then we're interested, of course, in Lorentzian time evolution. So we also analytically continue. Here I've drawn uh, the same generators, but now in the Lorentzian signature. On the far left, we, the order is the same. On the far left, we have the boost, B. In the middle, we have E. And on the right, we have uh, P, the momentum. I've also drawn in a Rindler wedge with a finite boundary. And yeah, so this is my picture of, of global ADS2 as well um, for future reference. So these are the generators that generate that little motion. The, I'm, I'm assuming that these two points, the, the point that I choose, this theta of phi one, is located close to imaginary time beta over two. Um, it's at beta over two minus epsilon. And another point is located at over just below it, at beta over two plus epsilon. Um, and these generators describe their relative motion. So their relative motion is generated uh, as you tune mu. Their relative motion is generated by an equal sub, by a sum of s plus j2 plus j1. Uh, j2 and j1 seem complicated, but actually, again, to anchor you, the only term that will survive will be s. The other terms will give a negligible contribution to size. And so this is maybe the first result is that we're in agreement with the Maldas and Alin uh, paper which got that the size is equal to, that the size is equal to the expectation of E minus B on the boundary, but by a very different method. Um, so to be more concrete, this is the uh, result that we find. Um, and it's, it's just as I mentioned that we have the sum of generators here. So let, let, let me explain this expression briefly on the left we have uh, something that's related to the size matrix elements of n at different times. Um, this GC is just the conformal, the usual conformal two-point function. Um, you can think of it as this, but without the, without the n. And this proportionality is to a fermion in bulk static ADS2. Uh, so this is a particular component of a fermion in bulk static ADS2, and you evaluate the expectation value of these generators in that free fermion. Uh, the fermion's mass is tuned such that its boundary dimension is one quarter, or sorry, one over Q to match the chi. 
So this result we'll use, um, but for now, let me just give the punchline of this section, uh, the size of the chi fermion. Um, we can find either from this expression or more directly from uh, the previous derivations. And so this is the size of a chi fermion on the boundary of SYK at strong coupling. But that's not our main focus. Our main focus is on the bulk. Uh, sorry, how much time do I have? Do I, I, do I have five minutes? Yes, you have, you have five minutes. I see. Do I have seven minutes? Yeah, I mean, we have the discussion, so we can just uh, oh, shift okay. a little bit of time. So okay. if you just need a little bit more, you can. You can I see. Okay. Um, so let me briefly talk about HKLL. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, I want to point out, I want to emphasize that throughout this talk, although I've been suggesting it, I haven't mentioned the bulk dual of SYK once. Um, and that's because I want to be sort of very cautious and agnostic as to what I say about what's going on in that bulk dual. Um, I'll say now that the bulk dual is believed to be some type of JT gravity with matter. Um, it's some complicated theory, but we take a much more uh, simplistic approach. So the, again, to reiterate the dual of SYK, you know, some sector of it is thought to be uh, a boundary gravity mode um, and the bulk space time, it looks like static ADS2, uh, in particular a single SYK uh, at finite temperature is dual to a Rindler wedge in ADS2. Um, so say we want to reconstruct a fermion in the bulk of some theory that has a dual. Well, there's a procedure called HKLL, uh, which I'll give a formula for in a second. But the intuition is just that you are allowed to propagate information from the boundary inside of the space-like separated region to the point that you're interested in. And so this is, these are, these are light rays and this is the space-like separated region. Um, something that's maybe less familiar about HKLL is that you can do perturbative HKLL interactions. So if the theory is nearly free, then this gives you a good approximation to the bulk fermion or your bulk field. But if your interactions are say in the bulk are suppressed by one over N, you can actually in principle compute those corrections by propagating information about the fields that the particle interacts with and propagating them forward. Now I've been using the term propagator. These propagators are not exactly the propagators that you're normally used to. Um, they're the space-like separated propagators. And here are the formulas to explain what I'm saying. Um, if GF is some Green's function for say the fermion wave equation, then the first equation is a tautology. Um, the second equation though is derived from the first and this piece is what's typically known as the HKLL kernel. So this is some function, uh, and you see that we integrate over the boundary. So this part piece highlighted in yellow is the HKLL kernel integrated against the boundary field. But then you have this same propagator, which represents this black arrow over here, let's say, and then the wave equation for psi. And so if there are interactions in the theory, then we can, this will be some expression in terms of fields and we can continue to expand it in a series of these propagators. Uh, we're taking the large n limit. We assume that interactions in the bulk of SYK are suppressed by one over n. And so uh, we will ignore this piece and just work with the leading part of the HKLL kernel. So, um, Part of this, a somewhat big part of this project was actually developing HKLL for fermions. Uh, before this, I, before this, there wasn't HKLL for, for fermions and there's a couple subtleties. Um, the, the, the kernel itself isn't that difficult to write. Actually, this is the kernel for a scalar field um, with, with this, with this space-like condition. Uh, this S infinity operator over here this you should think of as taking a spinner on a Rindler boundary and parallel transporting it from the boundary to your bulk point. Um, V1 is some particular spinner, and this is your K, uh, this, this is your, um, your HKLL kernel. So uh, there's two subtleties. One which has been dealt with uh, before is that the bulk spinner has an extra component, but it's important to keep in mind when you're thinking about this. 
Uh, one that we ran into that we had to deal with, um, which I guess you can ask me about later, it's, it's somewhat technical, but there's two quantizations when m is less than one half. And usually the one that people consider has scaling dimension bigger than a half. Um, this kernel is quite difficult to work with when delta is less than a half. Um, and actually it technically needs some modification. Uh, either by some regulator or uh, a contour prescription. Um, and so that, that subtlety is there. And as far as I know, uh, that we, we have the first discussion of this. Um, so the bulk size in general is uh, just this. Now, now, now since, since we have some simple multilinear expression for the bulk size, uh, I just literally wrote the n beta of psi j I mean, this, so, so this is the expression over here. This is the definition. And this is uh, up here. The first line is just very explicit in terms of the kernel. And um, a quantity that we found on the boundary, that quantity is right here. I just remind you, it's this expectation of generators. And so we can show, the punchline is we can show that J1 and J2 don't contribute. Um, these, uh, these fermions, I again remind you, so these X2 and X1, there are points on the boundary, but that match the Rindler time corresponding to T2 and T1. And so uh, if you work through all the constant factors, actually the size of the fermions, both in the bulk and near the boundary is given by an expression like this. It's just an expectation value of E minus B. Um, and so this, this is a concrete statement about all those conjectures that people had before. Um, for operators reconstructed by HKLL in the dual of SYK. Uh, if you want an expression to take home in the epsilon goes to zero limit, uh, these are the two expressions. Epsilon is some regulator set by uh, the fact that SYK isn't truly exactly conformal. And th this regulator is important. Uh, you can ask me about that if you're interested. But here is a picture of the size in the Rindler wedge uh, as you go along. There's a sharp increase near the near the Rindler horizon. And this is a contour plot here on the bottom. Um, OK, so I think I'm over time. So I'll quickly say this. Uh, this is a, so we, we can also take an expression at large Q that was found previously by Shelling and Alex Stryker. And we can use it because that expression is supposed to work at all couplings to compare uh, our expression to finite beta j corrections. And these are 3D plots. The fermion has, the bulk fermion has two components. So uh, this is for the component that corresponds to the boundary, to the boundary field. And the second plot is for the component that decays at the boundary that doesn't have a direct boundary analog. Um, and you can see that the error uh, in size the, is, is basically zero for all of the bulk. And then there's a big change near the boundary. Um, but this is, the, the, this is a difference between our approximation that I, that I pointed out on this page, this approximation, um, and, the, uh, and the exact numerical calculation. So it's interesting to look near to the boundary. And so this will be my last slide. Um, you can see that at the boundary, the size does the nice thing that you expect. For the boundary component, um, the, the field that really exists at the boundary, the size drops. Uh, dramatically. And that's good. Um, that means it's very simple to make the field out of itself. Whereas here, uh, for the non-boundary component, it has the same behavior up until it reaches somewhere near the boundary, but then it levels off as opposed to dropping. Uh, so yes, that's, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for, for the talk. So we still have a few minutes for, for some questions. So somebody wants to start. I actually have a question. Um, so you mentioned that, of course, some of these proposals of uh, the size operator is that it should be, uh, should be connected to ideas of complexity, right? Because it really does seem to see a localized version of the scrambling to the systems and things like this. Uh, do you have anything to say about the other conjectures that 
either the wormhole length should be connected to complexity or something that uh, are you concluding that uh, there is some relation with the size or it's a little bit of a different beast in certain limits they're similar um i don't have uh i i don't have any any new derivations in that direction um to the extent that the complexity uh grows exponentially for a long time with the same exponent as the size that's sort of been the reason for that relationship mm -hmm. where the complexity differs from the size i think that this shows that they're different that, that that's mm -hmm. the point. so if you yeah if you believe that the complexity is supposed to diverge from the size somewhere um this quantity will will not do that um, mm -hmm. but on the other hand that's probably somewhat difficult to probe uh, from the point of view of these calculations, because I think that probably uh, you will have to know that you're at finite n. Yes, this is a finite n correction. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, I'm, may, may, maybe one thing to say is that, of course, you know, you can see that the time derivative of size is going to be the time derivative of this e minus p. Um, this is this piece. This piece is 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 time translation mm -hmm. invariant. And so uh, what that means is that, you know, this is a relation between P and the time derivative of size. So again, if you want to relate P to complexity, I mean, this, this says what P is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you have any other questions for Yuri? Uh, yeah, I want to ask, uh, um, so you mentioned this, this regulator epsilon? Yes. Um, do you uh, do you know what else or is that is that computable in in syk is it related to other quantities or, or could you comment further further about that um as far as i know you can't determine its value exactly you can determine its scale so its scale is pi over beta j and as long as you choose so in our computations for example as long as you choose that scale you're basically choosing all you're doing is choosing a unit of size so you won't change any of the behavior uh, you'll only change the overall scaling. Um, and so, and so from our perspective, it's sort of, we're a little bit agnostic to the regulator, which is good. Uh, I think that, I think that it may even be problem dependent, um, what epsilon is chosen to be. So, uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, one, one other question. Uh, so the, in addition to, uh, to the size distribution, uh, those, those coefficients and the expansion have phases, right, at, at finite temperature. Um, can, you, can you use these same methods? Um, I mean, in large QSYK, as far as I understand, you can, you can uh, analytically continue to, to get those phases. Can you do something similar here? Uh, you are asking about the phases in, in these quantities? Exactly, yes. Yeah, maybe maybe if you're very interested, we can talk a little bit later. I've I've been thinking about it about how to do it this way. Um, oh yeah, I thought they are real. No, no. Sorry. If, if it's at infinite temperature for Hermitian operators, it is. But but at low temperatures, it picks up the phase. Oh, you, you mean when I when I do some kind of regularization that's not symmetric? Yeah, when acting on with you know rho rho to the one half. Yeah, yeah, non symmetric. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I would be interested. That's, it's a good that. question. That's, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe one comment about this question. Um, I think um, um, the size here reduced to like a commutator square. I mean, if you look at an average size of an operator, that's reduced to like a commutator square with a single fermion operator and then sum over a fermion. So, so that's how you relate to OTOC, like a bigger, longer string has more commutators. Um, sorry, and the comment, well, yeah, and the commutator if you have two Fermi operators. Um, but then there is some um, 
other kind of OTOC, which is like a commutator times the anti commutator. And I think that's uh, that may be measuring how this phase, maybe you can think of that as how this phase um, depend on, like how the phase is correlated with amplitude. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but, uh, um, but but that thing is even more even more leading order in some cases when you look at the OTOCs because it has like one less H bar than the commutators. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Maybe, maybe I'm reading into your question a little bit too much, but I think that you would be most interested in these phases in also a slightly different setup where I have two coupled SYKs in global ADS2 as opposed to just a render wave. Uh, I'd, I'd have to think about that more. <laughs> I agree they're related to different regularizations of OTOX. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we can discuss further after. Thanks. So do we have any more questions for Yuri? So if not, let's thank him again and we are gonna resume in one hour. Thank you. <laughs>